morning. Uh, it's uh, a true honor to be here. Uh, I just want to share a story of this girl with big dreams. I always wonder what informed that because of where she was born and when she was born. Born in 1959, during the hard days of apartheid, this girl wasn't supposed to have big dreams. I was born in a white suburb, a black girl looking around and everyone I saw who looked like me was either a domestic worker or a gardener. So I had no reason to have big dreams, but I did. And I always wonder what informed that, and I blame it on my parents, because if I was born that way, it's their fault. If they raised me that way, it was their fault. So I was a product, and I am a product of my parents' fault, and I'm not complaining. Um, you know, I was lucky that in spite of the people that I saw around the place I was born and lived in Westville, who looked like me, who actually didn't have a career that I aspired uh, towards, I was lucky that at the age of four, I met this guy who made an indelible mark in my life. He was well-dressed, well-mannered, well-spoken, he drove a nice car, and he treated my dad. That was the late Dr. Kabashe. May you rest in peace. I saw myself in him. I wanted to be him. And every vision of someone who looks like me uh, that I saw after that, I blocked. My focus was that doctor. So as a four-year-old, that was my aspiration. I was going to be a doctor. And everything I did after that was focused on working hard, wanting to do the right subjects and everything else. My life was just made. I was going to be a medical doctor. And I became one. I failed along the way, but I persevered and I became one. What became apparent as I lived life was that every decade of my life had a dream. And each dream was triggered by a vision. And it had to be someone who looked like me. Because when you, you see someone who looks like you achieve anything, it makes it possible and it makes it accessible. Second decade of my life, I happened to go to a graduation ceremony. And uh, as you would know, uh, in a graduation ceremony, you have a sea of people with their black academic attires in this country at least, and there'll be one or two that have the red one. It's different. In this instance, it was three PhD graduates. One of them happened to come from the township that I later went to with the Group Areas Act. And that stuck with me. I think as a child, I always aspired to do well, to excel to be different in a positive way. I wanted to have the PhD. Not because I understood what it means in terms of knowledge production. It wasn't for a noble cause. It was vanity of proving to myself that I can attain the top qualification. I had to defer that dream, but I didn't lose it because of many reasons. So, I became a doctor, I practiced as one, I loved it, and then I lost the passion. If you had time, I'll give you the story of what I think made me lose the passion, but part of it was crime. Being the person that I have always been, I have to have passion for whatever I choose to do, because then why bother wake up in the morning? I had to find another passion. And the other thing that I've learned is that you are not born anything, you become something, and education is your friend. So education enables you to be whatever you choose to be. You just have to put in the hard work. So I decided I'm going to go into business. It also helped that I wanted to be well off. 
I wanted to be financially independent. So you can see that this is a girl who actually had a lot of dreams, a lot of ambitions, and, uh, but then supported them with hard work and education. So I decided, if I'm going to be financially independent, I need multiple streams of income. And business answers that question, right? So I seek education because I wanted to know what I'm doing, because I wanted to start companies, I wanted to invest in companies. For you to be able to do that, you need to know what you're doing. And the MBA assisted me to do that, but a lot of learning along the way. And I do believe that my parents, again, are the culprits, because in spite of the, them being working class, being raised in a very racist uh, society, they never complained. They always made a plan. They always hustled. They always had different things to bring food on the table. And that is the person that I became. I became that person who starts different businesses. Some failed, some did OK, and I also invested in businesses, and most did OK. So it helped me to be financially uh, independent. So connecting dots, going back, that dog trait that I so wanted for just having it, uh, I did get it. It was in the fifth and sixth decade of my life that I did. And it's actually interesting that there was something good out of it. Starting with, I didn't need it, or at least I thought I didn't because I was in business. I wasn't an academic. I didn't intend to be one. So I had to find something I'm passionate about. As I explained, I'm driven by passion. So I've always been big on social justice, especially when it comes to gender inequality. So I took it upon myself to look at gender, but use an intersectional lens, gender, race, and social class. I used life stories. And the beauty with life stories is that you get into the mind and the life of a person and you journey with them through it. When I was done and when I graduated, I was like, I have to tell these women stories. You know why? That four-year-old girl didn't just become who she became, but it was for that guy that she saw. Imagine if I tell these stories to many four-year-olds, and one of the story triggers something in that child. It has a multiplier effect because she becomes something, and other four-year-olds see her, and they also become something. And that is why we have equal but different. And I've gone to schools in rural areas, townships, to tell the stories women's stories that have succeeded against all odds. All I want is to get that four-year-old triggered and be inspired to be somebody. Because if we are the most unequal country in the world and the majority don't have anything, they lose hope. When they lose hope, we see what happened last year in July. Hopelessness is not related to sustainability of the economy. So each one of us that find themselves in a position to do something positive and tell positive stories, we need to do that because that's the only way we're going to change this world. So the lessons that I've learned is that education opens the world. You meet people that you would not meet ordinarily. And please that use that opportunity to learn something about them, to find networks, because who you know is so important in life, not only for social selfish reasons, but you can change the world together. Because when you find that they are doing something that is related to what you're trying to do to achieve a economic growth in the country to achieve sustainable, inclusive growth, because that's the main thing. The growth 
has to be inclusive for it to be sustainable. If the majority are left behind, that is a crisis waiting to happen. Um, the things that I've learned in business, in life, is the importance of the partnerships you choose to have. Sometimes the numbers seem to work. Sometimes the business seems to work. But what I've learned is that unless there is an alignment of values with the partners that you choose, unless there is an alignment of goals and aspirations, sustainability of that relationship tends to be compromised. And for those that have lived for as many years that I have, it doesn't matter what type of relationship, whether it's personal relationships, it's a marriage, there has to be an alignment in values. So it's important that you test that and find that in the partners that you choose. And the lesson that I've learned is that Every time you reinvent yourself, you become a better person and you get fuller and better at whatever you do. And you become more open uh, to ideas. You become more open to people that are different from you. Because when you reinvent yourself, when you invest in yourself, you enter a terrain that's foreign to you. And it doesn't matter how good you were, where you came from, running your practice or running whatever business. When you come to a new space, it's like you're learning how to walk again. It makes you humble. So you don't judge people. I've found that it's helped me a lot, starting the different businesses that have started, meeting different people, and finding some people that are weak in some areas. I've always said, there's something good about this person. All I need is to find that. That has assisted me to be able to take someone who's a barista, train them, and now he's a facilities manager. The list is long. Look for the goodness in each of the people that you have the blessing to interact with, whether you're a boss, whether you're a peer, but it, it's possible. Every one of us has something positive. And if you want to be innovative, if we want to build this country, we need each and every one of us. So you don't give up on people just because of the way they look or the way you think they are stupid without getting to know them and find that brightness that each one of us has. You know, as I conclude, I've learned more so now than I did as a child. You know, when I was a child, my parents gave, and you'd wonder what from, because they didn't have much. But my dad had a Section 10A, those who've lived long enough know what that meant. So when the government of the day would actually say, we are sending you back to the homeland or the rural area, you can't be found in the city. He actually employed them because he had his small painting contracting company so that they would be able to be in the city and find a job. And he didn't make them pay. My mother was a primary school teacher. In the evening, she used to teach domestic workers how to read and write. And sometimes I would go and sit in. Sometimes she will say, I must teach. She was inculcating in me the thing of giving back as you learn, teach, as you get, give. Because I think the most fulfilling thing you are ever going to get, it's not the money that you'll make, but what you'll do for the next person, because it nourishes the soul. I spoke about reinventing yourself and investing in yourself, focusing on education, but it's not only education, it's your body, it's your mind, it's your soul. And sometimes we neglect the soul. And when we do that, we'll use the humanity. We always talk about Ubuntu, but you can't live Ubuntu without nourishing your soul at all times. You know, the things that I do now, the things that make me get the most joy are the things that I do to give as I get, 
to teach as I learn. I only became a teacher, qualified one, last year. Why? Because I've learned so much, and I do believe that the core of any na nation is quality education. And if we can give back by teaching all the things that we've learned, then we'll be a better country. The Female Academic Fel uh, Leaders Fellowship seeks to achieve that, have and develop a pipeline of African women academic leaders who will change the world. And it is my hope and ambition that we actually become a network that's global. African women in the diaspora sharing information, sharing, collaborating around research, and making this world a better place because we lived and cared enough to do something. I thank you.